Mankind has challenged the most hostile environments on Earth and lived to tell the tale. In surviving the devastating extremes of nature, he has endured suffering beyond his darkest nightmares. Survivor Science dramatically reconstructs true stories of human endurance to explore the science of survival. The tropical rainforest, a strange and beautiful yet deadly place. The basic law here is hunt or be hunted, eat or be eaten. Life and death are close handmaidens in the intense heat and humidity. The competition to survive is at its most extreme. The Amazonian Peruvian jungle has the greatest concentration of plant and animal life on earth. Here, Mother Nature is at her most diverse. 30 million different species of insects alone inhabit this vast ecosystem. To the people who live here, the jungle is a familiar and friendly place. But to outsiders, it can be alien and terrifying. Near Puculpa in Peru, two noted German zoologists, Marie and Hans Kupke, had established a research station. They were making a detailed study of rainforest ecology. With them lived their only child, 17-year-old Julianne. Survivor science reconstructs her extraordinary story. It begins in Lima, the capital, on Christmas Eve, 1971. Marie Kripke had flown to Lima to meet Julianne and complete her Christmas shopping. Julianne attended a secondary school in the city. During school vacations, she stayed with her parents at the research station. Like her parents, she loved the jungle and frequently joined them on field trips into the depths of the rainforest. Late that afternoon, they boarded a plane for the one and a half hour flight to Puculpa. It was late taking off. The passengers were frustrated by the delay Everyone wanted to be home for Christmas. Marie Krupka was particularly concerned. She disliked flying in Peru. Six months before, on this very route, she had experienced a near-crash landing in the rainforest. Julianne had no fear of flying and teased her mother. Half an hour into the flight, the aircraft experienced severe turbulence. Shortly afterwards, Marie's fears were justified. One of the engines caught fire. Still strapped in her seat, Julianne fell over 10,000 feet. Incredibly, the thick forest canopy broke her fall. She remained unconscious for several hours. When I came to, it was daylight. Everything was a blur. I turned to look where my mother had been sitting. There was nothing.
Julianne didn't know if her mother had survived the crash. Now, she was on her own, lost in two and a half million square miles of unmapped jungle. Her chances of survival were bleak. When I came to again, I felt really dizzy. My head was hurting and it seemed like my collarbone was broken. But strangely, I wasn't in any real pain. I was more concerned about my mother. I called to her, but no one answered. No one. I had to find help. I had to stay alive. If I stayed where I was, I'd never been found. The canopy was so dense, I could hardly see the sky. I tried to block out as many fears as I could and concentrate on getting through the undergrowth. I had been in the jungle many times, but never on my own. My parents told me if I was ever lost in the jungle, I had to look for a river because all the local Indians use the rivers. They're their highways. So I knew if I found one, I would eventually come across one of their villages and they could take me to Pakulpa where my father would be waiting for me. I kept looking for wreckage of the plane, hoping I'd find my mother. But there was no sign of anyone. On Christmas Day, the day after the explosion, Julianne came across a stream. She followed it, hoping it would lead to a river and eventual rescue. The jungle is teeming with insects. You lay your hand down for a moment and it'll be covered like a glove by ants. But the worst things are the mosquitoes and other flies. It was impossible to keep them away. I was constantly bitten. I didn't realize at the time they were laying their eggs under my skin. The heat and humidity exhausted me. I was soaking wet all the time, but at least I could walk. I wasn't too hungry and luckily there was plenty of clear water to drink. The only food I had was some boiled sweets I'd bought as Christmas presents for the children of our Indian guide, Awakina. He was always telling us there were lots of things we could eat in the jungle. Fruits, berries, nuts, leaves and roots. Mother was always keeping notes on whatever he said because she was convinced jungle vegetation held secrets which would cure many diseases. But she also said that most jungle plants and fruits had developed poisons to protect themselves from insects. Everywhere I looked, there seemed to be delicious looking fruits. I saw howler monkeys eating them, but I didn't dare. I was too scared they might be poisonous. The last thing I needed was to come down with a fever. Hans Kropke, Julianne's father, joined the search parties on Christmas morning. The light aircraft trawled back and forth over the exact area of the crash without knowing it. The wreckage had been completely swallowed by the dense canopy of the jungle. When darkness falls in the jungle, you cross a threshold. Shadows begin to move, attracted by the body's heat and the scent of blood.
Survival depends on staying alert. On the second day, as Julianne made her way through a dark grove of twisted roots, she heard the droning sound of flies. Seeing the dead passengers made me realize what might have happened to my mother. Julianne remembered the last time her family had been together. It was on her 17th birthday. By the third day, the stream had swollen to become a river. Julianne swam for hours, struggling to keep her mind off the lurking dangers she knew were everywhere. The search parties continued searching in vain. The forest canopy remained a beautiful, but impenetrable dome. I knew I was still far away from any people because none of the larger animals seemed scared of me. They just came to the riverbank to feed, which meant they weren't used to being hunted. By the fifth day, the pain from my broken collarbone began to make walking more difficult. But in spite of my pain, I moved on as best I could. As the river deepened, I got more frightened. I saw Cayman by the riverbank. They drag their prey beneath the surface, drown them, and store them underwater until they are tender enough to eat. I was also worried the blood from my cuts would attract piranha fish. I'd heard of piranhas turning people to skeletons in a minute, but I had no choice. Then I saw the vultures. Where there are vultures, there is usually dead flesh. I knew they'd been eating the people from the crash. The mosquitoes and flies never left me. My wounds were getting worse. The flies' eggs had grown into lava under my skin. I could actually feel them crawling and feeding on the tissue and fat. Some had pushed their heads through the sores. My arms felt raw and had begun to smell. I thought, oh my God, they'll have to amputate them. I had to do something. I got my ring, twisted it into a hook, and used it to pull the maggots out one by one. It was agonizing. I counted 33, but I knew there were more I couldn't get to.
For the first time since I'd left the wreckage, I wondered how long I could go on. Silently I called on those I loved to help me. In my heart, I knew now that I might die. On the seventh or eighth day, I'd lost count. I was completely exhausted. It was becoming difficult to concentrate. Even the simplest actions demanded a huge effort. My arm was a mess, and for the first time, I began to feel real pain. I tried to squeeze as many maggots out as I could, but as soon as I got one out, more flies would lay their eggs. Some of the wounds were so big, I could put my finger inside. There was nothing I could do except bandage them the best I could and hope the infection wouldn't spread. I felt my whole body was alive with parasites. I pictured them feeding on my blood and sapping my strength. Sometimes I felt as though the jungle didn't want me to escape, that it just wanted to devour me. Even the mud seemed to hold on to me and suck me down. I thought of my father all alone, and I said to myself, he's not going to lose his daughter. I will stay alive. I will. Close to complete exhaustion, Julianne came upon a canoe beside a flimsy hut on the riverbank. It looked as if it had just been built, but no one was around. She staggered to the shelter and collapsed. The shelter belonged to an Indian who hunted the area once a month. In the searing tropical heat, it took them two days to reach Turnavista, the nearest permanent settlement where there was a radio and an airstrip. A 17-year-old girl's fierce determination and considerable courage had helped her to survive for nine days lost in the rainforest. From Torna Vista, Julianne was flown to the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in Puculpa. With her assistance, the wreckage of the aircraft was finally discovered, scattered over a wide area. The aircraft, with 91 passengers on board, had suffered a catastrophic mid-air explosion. Julianne was the only survivor. 
According to some reports, 12 other passengers had survived the crash, but had stayed at the crash site and died much later of their wounds and exposure. Julianne had done the right thing by making her way to safety. Her mother's body was never recovered. Julianne did not lose her love of the rainforest. She later lived with her father at the research station, and like her parents, she too became a zoologist. Air crashes like the one Julianne survived are very rare. But with the growth of ecotourism and adventure holidays, there is an increasing number of people getting lost or having accidents in the jungle, sometimes with fatal consequences. An expert in jungle survival and medicine is Lieutenant Colonel Michael World. Julianne had numerous advantages. One of the most important was the practical local knowledge that she gained during the four years that her parents had run the remote Amazonian research station. The chances of somebody less experienced than Julianne surviving that experience is very remote indeed, I would suggest. After all, the subsequent investigation of the crash site suggested that some of the survivors were indeed alive when they hit the ground, but because they stayed at the crash site and didn't endeavour to make movement towards civilization, they didn't survive. Temperatures in the jungle reach the mid-90s Fahrenheit, and with humidity levels above 85%, the combination is potentially lethal. High environmental temperature will reduce your ability to radiate heat, so that will reduce heat loss, and the high humidity will reduce your ability to sweat, and therefore you will be unable to lose heat by that method. So you're at risk of developing heat injury. This is where one or more organs in the body may shut down with a very high chance that death will ensue. The important thing about drinking water is to do as Julianne did, head for fast-flowing streams of waterfalls and to drink that. She is remote from civilization, and that's a major factor in the safety of drinking water because it's unlikely to be contaminated with human excrement. The classical diarrheal diseases of cholera and typhoid are caused by contaminated water being drunk. Many of the jungle fruits and plants, especially the brightly colored ones, are extremely toxic. Animals in the rainforest have developed their own immunity to these poisons. For humans, they can be deadly. It is dangerous to eat anything in the jungle. I would only advise eating local fruits or plants in the most desperate of circumstances. It might be possible to take a chance and eat something perhaps discarded by a monkey, but local plants may contain substances which can have adverse effects on the heart and circulation. The South American rainforest is home to some of the world's most dangerous snakes. The anaconda, the world's largest snake, suffocates and swallows its victims whole. Cases have been recorded of humans being devoured in this way. A feu de lance is so deadly, a single bite can kill within hours. Dr. Heather Hall is the snake curator at London Zoo. The venom from snakes that you find in the Peruvian jungle is very venomous. It can have a, a very damaging effect and it can kill people. The effect is usually to break down tissues around the wound, to stop the blood from co coagulating, and also to send your system into shock. If you're in a remote place and it's going to take you several hours or even longer to get to a hospital, then you have to follow some very simple rules. The first is not to panic. Only a small percentage of people actually die from snake bite, and far more people actually can die of shock. The second thing is to keep wherever you've been bitten, which is usually a leg or a foot, you must keep that as still as possible so the venom doesn't work its way through your system and affect your whole body. Things like tourniquets or biting and sucking wounds are actually very outdated treatments for snake bite. We now say keep the limb as still as possible and get to a hospital as quickly as possible. The deadliest creature in the jungle is also one of the smallest, the fly. Mosquitoes and other flies transmit a large number of diseases. The most common is malaria. Malaria currently kills over three million people a year. The World Health Organization predicts mosquito-borne diseases will kill one in 17 people throughout the world. Less well known than a mosquito, but equally harmful is Julianne's tormentor, the botfly. 
so as not to put itself at risk, the cunning botfly captures other flies and lays its eggs on them. These are transferred to the victim when the carrier fly next feeds. The eggs hatch and the larvae burrow deep under the victim's skin. Dr. Martin Hall is an entomologist at the Natural History Museum in London. Julianne will certainly have felt the itching within a few hours of the larvae entering, but she may have you know, thought it was just a mosquito bite. But certainly within a few days, she will have felt the larvae beginning to move around. Dr. Hall knows what this feels like. Working in South America, he became infected with botflies. He took photographs of the larvae in his leg. Even though I'm an entomologist, I didn't actually suspect botfly until I got back to the UK. And so I put my leg on the the laboratory bench the next day under the microscope and had a look and about twice a minute I could see the rear end of the maggot coming up to the surface to breathe. Dr. Hall successfully removed the larvae and suffered no further ill effect. Someone who's in a jungle on her own like Julianne with bot flies I think she probably did the right thing in trying to remove them when they were young. If she'd left them till they were a bit bigger they would have been certainly a lot more difficult to remove. One has to be extremely careful about doing that because of the strange shape of these uh, bot flies. The head end being so much bigger than the tail end, it's quite easy to grasp the tail end and pull and then actually snap the maggot. And the maggot then will, will die, certainly, but it will die embedded in, in tissues. And so if Julianne had done that, she would certainly have been susceptible to getting bacterial infections and so forth in those wounds. They'll have gone septic and pussy and will have attracted other types of flies with even more lethal maggots. The most dangerous of these are the man-eating screwworm flies. These have the Latin name hominivorax and hominivorax actually means man-eater and that's quite literally what they do. These flies actually feed on living flesh and unless removed and treated they, they will kill the person. Troops who fought in the jungle during the Second World War in Vietnam were unprepared for its hostile physical environment. Many suffered terribly from fever and a variety of infections. Most of the survival techniques used today were developed during those wars. Two men who learned their survival skills in the U.S. Special Forces are Jay Stanka and Dave Kellerman. They run week-long training courses from their base on the Colorado River in Costa Rica. For them, the key to survival is being prepared. What you have on the table in front of you is what we consider some of the necessary and optional gear for going into a survival situation in the jungle. Uh, a lot of these items are, are something that you're going to really need to have with you, and some of them, such as the electronics, are ones that you never really want to depend on, but you would like to have if you could afford to carry them with you. But no matter what you see here on this table, every single one of you right now, as you're sitting, possesses the primary weapon that will determine your survival in any given situation. It's right here in your brain. And what we have is sort of a little moniker called survival. Each letter means something. And if you don't remember anything here, remember this, and it will help you. And remember, your mind is always your best weapon. It takes a normal person two to four weeks to become acclimated to a jungle environment. For water replacement, under normal conditions, a person needs two to three liters of water per day for the body to function effectively. Is it a good idea to take salt tablets for salt replacement? When you put a lot of salt directly into your stomach, what happens is that the water will passively follow the sodium and go into the vessels surrounding your intestines and that will bloat you and it takes it away from where you really need the water. What you want to do is you want to put the sodium or the salt on your food and not in your water. What I have here is a map of this general vicinity, where we are, Rio, Colorado. First thing you're going to want to do to determine where you are on the map is orient your map to your position. I have a simple handheld compass. Very simple thing, it can't break, nothing can go wrong with it. First thing you need to do is orient your map to north using the grid lines that are pre-marked on the map and the straight edge of the compass. You're going to take the red north indicator arrow and make sure it's pointing directly at north and square your compass off with one of the grid lines. So it's important to always know where you're at. It can help you get out of a bad situation. The main thing is always keep your compass away from metal objects. Let me just show you how that'll affect it again. See how it moves the indicator arrow? So essentially, we'd have the map all turned around. And look, look what it does. Just remember that.
Go and just hold up there for a second. I want to show you something. Come on, take a look at this. A lot of snake bite accidents happen by simply stepping on a snake. When you come to a big log like this, the thing you don't want to do is just step right over it like that. It's laying right here. Could be a snake. And if you step on him, he's going to bite you. You know, we've been walking a lot through the jungle and we haven't seen anything. They hear us coming and they go the other way. But when they're laying on the other side of a log, and instead of doing this, taking a look, you just go, one, two, boom. That's when the accident's going to happen. Let's walk a little bit further. Maybe we can find something else. Remember to step on top of that log. The course is not for the faint-hearted. Two nights are spent in the most inhospitable areas of the jungle. Here, the group have to put into practice some of the skills learned in the classroom. All right, what we've done is we've gone ahead and started on a camp for you guys based on all the stuff we talked about in the class. Uh, let me just show you what we got here. This is the framework for a lean-to based on the two-tree method, which we talked about. You notice how much water's in here. And what we did, we picked a site to show you that no matter how miserable it is, you can always make a dry bed. There's always a way to do it. And what we've done is taken <clears throat> forked branches from the trees, which we've cut using our machete. We've laid and stuck them into the ground and laid larger logs across and essentially use these cross pieces, which are going to be your bed for the next couple days. You notice that this water is about six inches deep. The bed's about eight to ten inches off the ground. It's going to keep you dry and a little less miserable. And what we're going to do in a few minutes is we're going to go and we're going to finish off the shelter by getting some palm fronds to lay over the top of it to waterproof it better. Remember that we want to place the leaves with their natural growth going in a downward motion that can funnel the rainwater away from you. We want to overlap them as much as possible. Hi, Dan. Just like Mississippi River here. Yeah, more? Very nice. Yeah, you got a couple more? Probably a couple, couple more. more. Just yeah, make in case the water higher. comes up, we're going to need yeah. to get a little bit higher. We're going to use this insert propellant since the wood's a little damp, and since we have it, we might as well use it because it's going to make the fire start that much faster. So go ahead and, and spray it right in here on the kindling as much as you can. Insert propellant? Yeah, just a little bit. Right in there. A little, more. A little bit over here. Okay, that should be good. Now's the time to dry your feet off. Yep. See now, you see how the smoke's going? It's going right towards the camp and not directly into where you'd be lying. And we've got some green leaves over here too. You can put on every once in a while. And the green leaves will help keep bugs away. But make sure you don't burn any poisonous plants or anything, because that puts it up into the air. Yeah, what we're doing here is uh, we're putting mud all over ourselves for the purpose of. Uh, Making a barrier against uh, mosquitoes because they can get real thick sometimes out there in the bush. Also uh, against the sun. People pay big bucks for this in New York. That's all right. It's good stuff there. But one can never predict the vagaries and extremes of the jungle. It is a world in a constant state of flux. Your ability to adapt is a measure of your potential for survival. On the San Juan River between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, the rain goddess cruises downriver. It is owned by two remarkable doctors. This is their own terrifying story. Dr. Paul Shirley is one of America's top orthopedic surgeons. His friend and partner, Dr. Alfredo Lopez, is a Costa Rican GP. We've been doing this for about four or five years now and they call me medicine man. There's no medical help in this area. There's a lot of goodwill and intention, but there's no qualified doctors that'll go back into the jungle or donate their time. So when we come, people will know and then they'll call us, oh, I have a child that's sick or my wife is uh, bleeding. So we, we take the time. Lopez and Shirley were experienced hunters but they had never spent a night alone in the jungle without a local tracker. 
we'd been talking about just the two of us getting away and it was the first time that we'd really had a chance where we had a two-day period and really could get out and do what we wanted to which was go for a good long hike and spend the night in the jungle and come out the next day refreshed. Shirley and Lopez were well prepared. They took with them guns, food, water, bedrolls, in fact, everything necessary to make the journey a pleasant experience. They also had a GPS device. By using satellite technology, they could pinpoint their location precisely. The jungle is no place for weakness, but the strength that is demanded of every survivor is not always physical. In the case of Lopez and Shirley, both men's emotional and spiritual reserves would be called upon in the days ahead, an experience which would alter their relationship forever. Well, some of the dangers that we're likely to find would be snakes, some of the terrain, it's easy to slip and fall, or going through the rivers or the jungle swamps, it's easy to catch a leg or get hurt. The bugs get to be very distracting. And of course, we always be worried about getting lost. We were only able to go a few hours before it started to get dark. So we set up a camp and made a covering. It was actually very comfortable. Uh, the mosquitoes were kept away and the floors had the foam padding we put down and leaves and we worked together to do that. Out of the way. Here. <coughs> we yeah. unpacked some you know, of our packs and uh, basically had like a very peaceful evening in the rain, fairly dry. <laughs> oh, we deserve it after today. <laughs> Ooh, kind what of was that? That's Got probably that, an ocelot. That we'll raised the hair on the back of my neck. <laughs> on day two, things began to go badly wrong. When they broke camp, they left behind their only packet of salt. Incredibly, this was to prove a near fatal error. Then without warning, heavy rain began. Rain that turned the ground to thick, sticky mud. The going became torturously slow and difficult the swamp level rose, obliterating the once recognizable jungle trail. The problem would be, for instance, you'd like to follow the sidewalks in Venice and not step off into the canals. And uh, not knowing where the sidewalks were in this particular jungle was uh, very much a disadvantage because even though we had the general direction, we often lacked the specific knowledge and the, the weather had made it very unforgiving and it was very physically stressful. Mm. It's good, man, it's fresh. Well, that's all we need. This thing's got water in it, it's ruined. Going through that swamp, it must have really got some water into it. At we this point, go. the GPS had gone bad. It yeah. had moisture in it and wasn't yeah, working. And uh, we also south realized east. that the metal in the gun barrels had been causing deviations in the compass reading by not getting oh, it well away from the gun barrel. Every time. Easy. Look at that. If we can get back up on the range, up on the edge of the, out of this swamp, we might be able to get a little bit better reading and follow along the edge and make up for that 15 degrees. We had been going from sun up. We'd only been probably four or five kilometers. We hadn't had any food. And I had sweated incredibly. And I've had heat stroke before. And I knew that I was losing salt very, very rapidly. Oh. I was a very hardy man, he's a very brave person. And, but those cramps were outside his control. I mean, he was just having them because he was so low in sodium. Oh, God! Oh. Some people oh, lose no, great amounts of salt uh, when they sweat. And Paul's one of these people. 
and you need salt for your conduction of electricity. So what happens is, because of the lack of salts, your muscles go into spasms. He started with his big leg muscles, but then he had them in his shoulder and his chest muscles, in his abdominals muscles, he had them in his face muscles. We knew it was serious and we knew we had to get salt to him some way. The rain continued throughout the night. By the following morning, the swamp was three inches higher, and Shirley's agonizing cramps had become worse. We had to either go back, which I could have. It was a day and a half tracking back to the lake and wait for somebody to come look for us. Or I could try to cut across the jungle uh, along the swamps and just reach the edge of the river, which I thought was six or eight hours away. My deep concern was that Paul's sodium level would drop down so low that it would affect his respiratory or his heart muscles. Lopez finally decided to leave Shirley and head out across the swamp. He could not have known how difficult it was going to be. With conditions deteriorating, it took him nearly an hour to walk a hundred yards. During the day, I just spoke to myself a lot. And I'd say, okay, we need to go to that tree. Let's go this way. What kind of tracks are underground? What kind of animals are underground? You know, that type of thing. I try to keep myself busy with the problem I had at hand because I knew I was basically not just my own chance of survival, I was Paul's chance of survival. We had agreed to signal by him shooting so I would get an idea how far away he was. And after all day, when I heard the gunshot from less than a mile away, uh, my heart just sank. I knew he was nowhere near the river. I knew that I had another day or two to be there alone. And I began to think that the likelihood of my coming out of this alive had just dropped tremendously. Lopez's chances of surviving were also diminishing by the hour. He had no food, and the swamp carried dangerous bacteria. I talk to myself constantly, uh, survival, it's in your mind, it's basically psychological. You just can't give up, you gotta push forward and forward at one inch at a time. What kept me going were several things. First of all, my wife and our children. My responsibility to Paul, it was my idea to take that hike in the jungle. If he died, I was responsible morally. Hunger disappears with exhaustion, and you develop ketones, and ketones suppress appetite. And in the course of the few days, I did lose 12 pounds. I decided I had to eat, and I noticed these little minnows, so I pushed the mosquito netting down in the water, and I made a game out of it while I was awake and alert, and I would catch them and eat them. I think that what Alfredo did, he was fortunate to have the physical stamina to do it, or the makeup to do it, but it took a tremendous lion's heart to do what he did. So there was, uh, it was very difficult mentally. I slept, I prayed, I thought about things, I relegated my life of what would happen to my kids, my practice, my patients. And I got very comfortable with the fact that I probably was never going to leave that particular little bit of uh, heaven. Jaguars and animals like that, they, they're not going to bother you, they're not going to hurt you. Constant present danger in this part of the world is the big herds of, of peccaries. They're running anywhere from 60 to 600. And if they find you on the ground, they're going to kill you. They're going to eat you.
a lot of things went through my head. I really I communed with my father who had passed away, and I had many, many thoughts. I decided that if I really got terrible, that I was going to go into the clearing and shoot myself because I wanted the vultures to attract people. Because I really didn't want to just disappear into the swamps and have the chance that my kids wouldn't get my insurance policy for seven years. Meanwhile, Lopez's wife had alerted the Costa Rican Red Cross, the American Embassy, and the Nicaraguan Army, who dropped the border restrictions so rescue efforts could be coordinated. In the late afternoon, I thought I heard something, and I fired my rifle. Aquí! Aquí! Somebody answered me, and I was floored. Where's Alfredo? The first question was, where is Alfredo? And they told me that they hadn't heard from him. And my heart dropped again. Lopez was unaware of Shirley's rescue. For the last three days, he hadn't eaten, and his body's glucose level was now dangerously low. I was pretty desperate, but I felt at the end that I was going to crawl if I had to, but I was going to make it somewhere. On the fifth day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, I saw some chestnut-headed oral pendulums. Oral pendulums are birds that make their hanging bird's nests by the river. I knew that the big main river had to be closed. somebody had come and the first thing I asked we need to find Paul I know where he is and I was willing to turn around and even go back the way I'd come and they told me no Paul Paul we found him yesterday they're bringing him out today After five days in the jungle, Shirley and Lopez were rescued by local trackers and the Nicaraguan army. They were flown to the headquarters of the Costa Rican Red Cross. After treatment, Dr. Shirley made a quick recovery. And apart from a few cuts and bruises, Dr. Lopez was remarkably healthy. But the emotional scars remain. Both men still find it difficult to talk about their experience. Hey, we got another chance. God wanted us to be alive for some reason. I was so glad to see you. Hey. Makes you wonder why. Well, we'll continue to be doing our work, taking care of the people. We'll move forward, like I said. We got another chance thanks to a lot of people, a lot of coordination, a lot of help from a lot of different people. In difficult environmental circumstances, when everything seems hopeless, the will to live becomes all important. The psychological determination to succeed becomes one of the most important factors of survival. But is the will to survive enough? The jungle is a unique environment. Here, a myriad of different life forms compete side by side. Those that have the capability to use the jungle's provisions to the fullest, and at the same time, defend themselves against predators, are the species that are going to survive. In this intense arena, life and death are locked in a constant embrace. The main problem with the jungle is the large number of problems which exist. When you're confronted with so many environmental hazards, it's difficult to take precautions against all of them. Therefore, good luck has to be one aspect of your survival. 
no matter how well prepared you are and how well you think you know something and yeah, that things can go wrong and pile up one on top of the other and disaster can happen at any given moment. You can survive if you're mentally tough and God wants you to. The South American rainforest has the largest diversity of species on the planet. Some see it as God's incubator. For Julianne Kupke and the two doctors, their journeys into the heart of darkness were a terrifying experience, an experience that tested them to the limits of their endurance. They were lucky. They survived. Yet with proper training and an understanding of the dangers, the jungle is perhaps the most fascinating and beautiful place on Earth. <laughs> 